right. I think it's about 9 p.m. here in Denmark, and I think it's 3 p.m. in the U.S. I am Malene Heckenberger, and I'm so happy to have this hour with you across the pond. Um, I have my uh, husband here. He's going to be the moderator. I have Leslie Cornwell here as well. And um, please let us know in the comments where you guys are from, what state you're from, if you're a midwife, if you're a doula, if you're a clinician. It's always fun to, uh, to uh, see where people are from. And uh, I think we will slowly get started. I just want to say a few things first. I'm going to present this uh, presentation. It takes about 40 minutes, and then we have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Uh, all that's been filmed in this presentation has been under informed consent. All the women have been had local anesthesia. I will tell you how, how, how I administer that, but it's just so I don't say it uh, before every, every uh, video. So let's get started. And um, I am Malene Hegenberger. I'm trained as a nurse midwife. I have been a nurse midwife for 20 years. And I've always had a very keen interest in suturing, in the correct diagnosis and how we treat women uh, when we suture and how we, how we uh, treat women after, uh, uh, after the delivery. I think that part of delivery is very interesting. And I think there's a lot to be improved. I think it leads a lot more focus and a lot more prestige in female health, that part of labor delivery. So let's slowly begin. Um, the challenges uh, uh, in the labor ward from my perspective is that eight out of 10 women preemie gravidas need some kind of suturing. It can be only a couple of stitches or it can be a really complex suture or tear. And for the patient, the procedure takes about 30 to 60 minutes in either the labor ward or in the OR, you know, from when we open up until we start diagnosing, until we suture, until we finish. So it's actually quite a big task we have after the baby's born. And the procedure can be very unnecessarily painful for the patient or the woman. Uh, it's, it means a lot to me that we focus on good local anesthesia, that we test that it's working and that we don't start any suturing procedures before we have a clear communication with the woman that it's actually working. I think that's very important. And then the procedure sometimes can disrupt the first hours between mother and newborn. And if I were the president of all women labor delivery wards, I would, there would be plenty of time to align with the mother, whether she would want to breastfeed first, or if she want to us to uh, suture her. I think in uh, initials, uh, uh, breastfeeding and suturing. I don't think those two go together really well. I think we have to align with her what she prefers and then we take it from there. But I know that's a dream scenario. I know there's lots of departments out there where it's busy, You they knock on the door, you, they want you to wrap up the things and do your paperwork so that she, they can have the labor room. I know all that, I'm out there myself, but it's just a dream scenario. Maylene, if you want to expand on the eight out of 10 women, there was a comment and that was shocking to me as a statistic. Where did this data come from? Or like in the those US, are, I guess to us, that those really are, is surprising. Those are don't a Danish, perceive Danish it as suturing needing that much. Yeah, that's Danish data from one of our biggest university hospitals in Skype in Aarhus. And then the, an incorrect diagnosis or bad repair or poor repair that can actually have lifelong consequences for the patients and or for the women. And then I think uh, we have a lot of silent women out there who actually live with a poor diagnosis or bad repair and they don't complain. They don't go and have somebody look at it because they think it's a common part of being uh, uh, having delivered babies. And then for us as clinicians, the procedure is associated with really awkward working positions over an extended period of time. We work all hours of the day. We sit in really poor ergonomic situations with our less dominant hand because we always hold the suture, the needle holder with our right hand. So it's the left arm, uh, I'm right-handed. So it's my left arm that's being worked a lot in when I'm actually very tired. And we all know that when the baby's out, the full APGRA score, then you kind of get that adrenaline kick that you know, you, this is why we're midwives. This is a really the tip of the, the uh, whole process. 
And then when we sit down to suture and diagnose, we can actually feel how tight we are in our bodies. And that is where the, some of the work-related injuries happen because we're so focused on finishing the care and the procedure that we actually don't feel our shoulders and our wrists. And then it can be very stressful to work with a patient in pain or a woman in pain. And this is something compared to other surgical procedures where the, the, the patient comes in for a full anesthesia or they come in for a, a walk-in clinic appointment, they get music in the ear and the surgeon has full uh, a quiet room and they can actually focus on the, on the job at hand. And the same if the patient is, a, is asleep. Here we're sitting doing something in a room with a very different synergy. We have a physical tired mom, we have a psychological very happy but also very tired mom and then we have a father in the room who can be really tired happy exhausted and maybe sometimes we have a mother-in-law we have siblings we have friends so it's a very dynamic room and there we have to sit and do something to the woman to the patient that she has to live with for for many years to come and i think that's something that we don't really speak about that's something that's always been within midwifery it's been part of the joy but sometimes it can also be a part of what makes it difficult. So I think that's a big difference in our field compared to other uh, areas. And then a correct diagnosis can be very challenging. Uh, I still have a second pair of eyes, a very common to, to make sure it's not a second degree or a third degree. Uh, I wanna make sure that no fibers have uh, um, got, uh, been affected in the sphincter. And so in our department, we are very open. We, we use each other a lot to make sure that we have the correct diagnosis. We have very open doors when it comes to suturing and supporting each other. And then we work in a very confined space. It's like a soft corner organ. And there we have very elevated risk of needle stick injuries. You know, it's the OR nurses and the surgeon and the midwives who are in the top 10 of needle stick injuries. And we all know how very annoying that is to have to go to the ER to fill out the papers, get the, get the shots and the blood works and all that. So if we can avoid some needle stick injuries, I think that's really good. And then sometimes we need an assistant to, be, to hold the size so we can actually see the high vaginal tears. Uh, and I've actually just today, I've been to visit a big hospital where we did three suturings together and it was two of them were very high vaginal tears. So it's very important that we can see, identify the apex of the, of the tear. These are some of the challenges in the labor ward. If you have a complex tear, uh, you need to uh, support each other. You need to hold the side. And this is what really uh, bothers me is that we need some kind of tools to assist us in this process. And this is one of my favorite pictures. I, there's three clinicians who are standing in really bad, poor economic situations with a strain on the lower backs. I'm holding a side, that's my shoulders. The woman does not have her legs correctly in stirrups and she's in a pain. So there's so much in this here that I would like to improve when it comes to female health. Uh, if suturing is needed. So the benefits for the solution, the Hagenberger speculum, uh, just a quick background. I start, I got the idea about 15 years ago, and then I had three children. I kind of kept it in my mind. And then after I've been four years in the US, I returned to Denmark, and then I started slowly developing at home. And now here, five years later, we are getting out on the European market and we hopefully will enter the US market in the summer very quickly. But these are the benefits that I needed, that I was looking for when I got the idea. Uh, I was sitting one night at 4 p.m. Uh, 4 a.m. and I was kind of wiping and wiping and it was so busy in the, in the department, there was nobody to help me. And I was thinking, if only I could place something in there that would hold aside for me. Uh, so that's where, that's how I got the idea. The benefits for the patient when using the Hagenberger is that it decreases the pain during a repair and it increases her ability to relax during repair. And now I'm sure you're all wondering how on earth I will place an instrument in a woman who's just given birth. And this is one of the biggest surprises in this whole process is it actually is less pain. I had expected her to scream and yell and ask me to pull it out. But when, when it's placed, the Hagenberger speculum, and you hold it still and you slowly let go, then there's no pain. It's a, and it holds aside the external genitals, very gently holds it aside. So that's, I will show you that later on. 
And then there's a decreased suturing time. I don't have a clinical study yet. It's coming. We just got the CE certification last year. So now we are working into the clinical studies. I know there's a lot going on in the UK, so we're very excited. Uh, but I can tell from my own experience that if you, whether you are closing the vaginal floor in one layer or in two layers, that's where you save a lot of time, especially the high vaginal tears, that's where you save time. And then you can, uh, the mother and the baby can quicker get reunited. The puerile body, when closing that, that's not where you save time, but it's definitely in the vaginal floor. And then you have a more correct diagnosis because you can see the layers, you can actually pull up the septum uh, and you can see if there's a septum defect, you can see the different structures in your, in your hair. And when you're looking for the sphincter, you don't have to use your hands to hold the side. You actually have a clear view all down through the pineal body. And this is what I wanted. I wanted to make an instrument that was fit for the female pelvis that would hold aside the labia and that would sit by itself. Everything else we have is basically from way generations back and it always uh, needs an assistant and it's not made for a, a vagina. It's made like a 90 degree angle speculum, most of them, or there's some kind of locking mechanism that's in our way. I wanted an instrument that could sit by itself that kept the whole uh, perineal body clear of instruments or locking mechanism and something that I could use for myself as a midwife. So for the clinicians, it gives us the ability to see the vaginal tear during the suturing. That means you, you don't have to separate and go in and refine your tear. You can actually suture while you're seeing your tear. And then we can use correct suturing technique. And with that, I mean using a needle holder and a forcep. Uh, midwives, we have been trained over generations to take care of the whole delivery by ourselves, and that includes the suturing by ourselves. We don't have an assistant. And that's why through generations, we have learned to go in and take the needle with our fingers. I think it's time to step up midwifery when it comes to suturing. I need it's time to refine our surgical techniques so we actually do not touch that needle with our fingers. We actually suture with a correct suturing technique. And then there's improved suturing technique. And that means, with that, I mean, if you have, let's say you have a lateral tear at seven o'clock, you put in the speculum to the side, and then sometimes you need to pull up some tissue from the, the floor, and sometimes you need to pull down some tissue from the wall to meet our ends. And here you can actually see it while you're doing it. And with that, I mean that we improved our suturing uh, technique as well. Then of course, there's a decreased risk of needle stick injuries. And then my biggest thing is improved learning situations for inexperienced doctors and midwives. I think it's so important that we that we get the new midwives, the, the young OBGYNs off a really good start because they're going to suit you hundreds, if not thousands of women. So if they learn to diagnose well, they learn to suit you well from the beginning during the training and the, during the, the first years, then we are into a really big improvement when it comes to female health. Uh, I think it needs a lot more prestige and a lot more focus. It's not just something you wrap up in my, uh, in my, uh, in my mind. Just before we start uh, with the uh, speculum itself, I just want to point out positioning of the woman, uh, the, uh, the patient before uh, suturing. And here it's come to my mind that in the Scandinavian countries, I don't know how it is in the US, but we don't learn how to position the woman for a correct suture or for a suturing. Uh, nine out of 10 times when I visit a department, then the woman is kind of in, uh, she's sometimes, if she delivered in the labor board bed, she's still in that position. If she's been on the side or if she's been in the bathtub or on the floor, then we put her in the bed and then she's lying holding her legs uh, herself. But if you, uh, if there's no doubt that she needs suturing, then it's in my opinion that she needs to be, have a proper position so that you can actually see all three openings. You can see the urethra, the vagina, and the anus. And uh, that's very important. Every good suturing starts with a good position. Um, so the, here are just my four tips. So the first one is bottom all the way out to the edge of the bed. We all do that uh, most countries on a global level. Here, correct positioning before uh, with the knees. This is where I see most the midwives, they struggle. You have to use the stirrup correctly and in your favor and in, your, in the favor of your 
you know, the birthing person or the woman. So I think getting those therapies to get the knees to point out, that's really, really key. And then in most cases, the women are sitting up. And I would really recommend that you lie down the lower back so that the weight of the uterus, which is one kilo, that goes into the mattress, not into the vagina, because we're done pushing out, you know, we're done pushing and we're done using the gravity to get the baby out. Now we need the gravity for something else. So if she's sitting up, then sometimes you also see the cervix coming down into the introitus, but lie the lower back down so she's completely horizontal. Then you put pillows behind her back behind her elbow, so she still feels in control. She's still skin to skin with the baby. You can still communicate and it's not degrading in a way. I think that's very important uh, to get. So you, when, you, when you inspect, you don't have to go behind the pubic bone and look up. You can actually look in. Um, so keep that in mind. And then if you have this function with a slight trending board in your department, that is, please use, use it. When you get used to it, it is, changes everything. So you just tilt the whole bed a little bit, then you raise the head of the mom a little so she can still communicate, but then you have a really good clear area or look over the pineal. So here I just have a slightly little video just to see how it is in my department. So you adjust the stirrups in the height of the thigh, because some women have really high thighs and short legs. But it's this function here that is super important. Use those stirrups and get the weight away from the pineal area. If you do this, then you move so much weight away from the thighs and the buttocks, and you can actually get much better working uh, conditions. And then the edge all the way out to the edge, uh, the bum all the way out to the edge of the bed, the lower back horizontal, so the weight of the uterus is into the mattress, not pushing into the vagina. And then the last thing is actually to just tilt the whole bed just ever so slightly so that the, the, whole, um, so that the whole pelvis is tilted towards you, you know, and then you raise the head of the mom a little so she's still comfortable um, with her baby but it changes everything. So use this in your favor. It always takes longer to suit you than you think. Here we have a clinic in Copenhagen. It's, a, it's not a home birth, uh, it's a clinic setting, which is really nice here. They have a queen size bed and here they've made some stirrups in case the woman needs suturing. She can actually stay in her queen size bed and you can actually still protect your back and your shoulders and you can see well and it keeps the, the, uh, the clinical setting or uh, the, the, um, the nice feeling uh, stays there. Here, we made it as a home birth setting. I delivered my babies at home as well, two, uh, one and a half. The other second one didn't want to come out. But you know, to think, to go through your house before a home birth to say, if you do need a, a suturing or do you, if you have a, a bleeding artery or something from, from and I need to help you, I need to suit you and make sure that you're okay. Where is a good place in this house to actually do that? And here we have a normal size bed. Uh, we took two bar stools, put some pillows up. So she has her legs up as if they were in stirrups so that her pelvic floor is relaxed. And then I take in a big, uh, what do you call a big tray? And I actually just padded it with some absorbable material. I put that under her pelvis. So you kind of lift it out of the mattress and then a blanket under her lower back so that she's lifted up. And then I also have a little the tray for my instruments. So this is a way to, to work at home so that you sit well and you can suture and see well. And at the same time, it's in her house. Uh, this, is if, this is on a futon mattress, so it's almost down on the floor. And here we, we just see we've taken two chairs and we padded them differently. One is very padded if she has high legs and the other one is not so padded if she has low legs. So it's just a, a way to make it work for, for everyone. And they need just, I remember when I delivered, the, my midwife was on the floor and I was in a futon bed holding my own legs and that did not uh, feel really well for either of us. So it's something I think to consider. Here we have, uh, now we will start to show how the speculum works. This is a second degree tear in a preemie gravida, she's had a pudendal block, transcutaneous pudendal block is something we use a lot in, in uh, Europe, oh, no, sorry, in Scandinavia. Uh, it's where you go through the buttocks uh, with the needle and uh, then she's had lidocaine gel on her gauze. 
and I then I take down the legs and then I leave her for 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, I actually place the woman in the, the, in the position that I did before. And then I test my local anesthesia with a forcep and so that the woman knows that it actually works. And then you can place uh, the speculum. So in this video here, I have placed an episiotomy tampon inside the speculum. I sometimes do that if it's not a high vaginal tear, uh, but this very, very uh, um, up to the single uh, person, the single clinician. So you separate the, uh, the labia a little bit, and then you place the speculum towards the vaginal floor. And then you follow the, the uh, vaginal floor and then you go all the way in until the circles of the speculum is at the label le level of the labia. Then you leave it and you ask her to relax. You hold it still for a couple of seconds so that the woman can follow you. And then when it's placed, you slowly let go. Uh, the woman has just delivered a baby show. She wanna push this out, she can do it. And then you adjust the side so that you see the edges of the wound. Uh, and then now you're ready to suture. So it, it's painful for the patient or for the woman to have it placed. That takes about 10, 12 seconds. And it's also painful to be removed. But when it sits during your suturing, it should not be painful. If it's painful, it's because she has an extended bladder she doesn't have good, well-working local anesthesia or if she position is not correctly so that you're kind of pushing it uh, wrongly and you're just kind of pushing up the uterus. And when you let go of the speculum, then the uterus slides down again and the speculum comes out. So those are the things you can, you can check into if you find that the speculum is sliding out. Here we have a lateral tear. It, it could look like an episiotomy. It's not really. We have a very low episiotomy rate in Denmark. I think it's about 4%. This is a lateral tear, but the trick is that you place the speculum as you turn it to where you need to suture. You can see here that I turn it a little bit. See, it go in sideways. And then beside that, it's exactly the same thing. You go slowly in the whole way until the circles are at the side of the labia. Then you ask her to relax. And when she's relaxed, you slowly let go. And now you'll see that the speculum slides out a little. It kind of locks itself behind the pubic bone. And that's, the, that's how it sits uh, by itself. Um, and then you adjust it a little. If it slides out, then you do the things I said before. You reposition the woman. You make sure that she doesn't have an, an, a full bladder, local anesthesia. And then you can also place an episiotomy tampon that kind of creates a vacuum in the far back. Um, here we have a very lateral tear. Um, and you see, I turn the speculum all the way up on the side and you slowly place it exactly the same way. Hold it still a little bit and have it, have her relaxed. This, this woman here was very relaxed. She had a really well working um, epidural. So we didn't hold it still for that long. And then after that, the tear was not as high as we thought it was. So we decided to uh, place an episiotomy tampon. And there you have to take the big ones, not the small ones. So you kind of hold on to the speculum and then you kind of roll it in with your index finger slowly and gently until it's in the far, um, off, in the far end of the speculum. And then you place the string to the side and then you have a very dry area and takes the, the bleeding from the uterus and, um, and you can go and address the top of the tear. So this is a picture of how we do it now and how we've done it for generations. We go in, we find the apex of the tear, we pull down and push out to the side. And this is a lot of strain on our left hands or depending on what hand you are suturing with. Uh, the hand that holds the side is under a lot of stress. Your wrist, your fingers, your elbow and your shoulder is very uh, prone to work-related injuries if you do this a lot for, for many years. Uh, and this, the next picture is actually the same patient, same woman with the speculum in place. So here we have placed the speculum with a, 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 a episiotomy tampon. And this is a, a newly qualified midwife and uh, she's being trained 
or she's being supervised. And here she's identifying the musculus transverse. That means she, she, she finds the muscle, she pulls in it, and she, she feels, she palpates on the skin that it's actually the muscle that she's pulling before she starts to suture. And the, the supervisor or the senior midwife can sit next to the, to the uh, student or the young midwife. And it's such a different way to train, uh, to, um, to, to uh, educate these uh, future midwives. It's much less stressful, much less pain for the patient, the woman. And I, as a supervisor, can sit and we can, I sit really well and I can chit chat with the parents. I can tell her that she, what she's doing is really well. And the focus uh, is on the training. And the focus is on that the woman uh, who's being sutures is comfortable. And that means that the stress on the student, the stress on the young doctor or the young midwife decreases a lot. Because if I were to stand on hold aside, it would only be 11 minutes. Then I would start, my nonverbal language would be like, come on, come on, be done. Because I can't stand here forever. And uh, here it's very different. The focus is on, what are we doing? What do you see? What kind of suturing material are you using? Uh, what kind of degree of tear is this? So it, it optimizes the learning. And I just, I really like it. I love it when the students, they go out and they have got a really good learning curve. This is a continuous suture in the vagina. Uh, this is uh, an episiotomy. And this is just one layer of closing the mucosa. And you can see how we can use the correct suturing technique. There's no traffic in and out. There's no separating with our hands. That's much, much less manipulation of the, uh, of the genitals. And the woman is very relaxed and she can actually enjoy her baby. Um, I think she's actually on the phone as we are uh, suturing here. Uh, so some of the senior midwives, they say, well, the tail looks so much bigger. It's so much more open. Yes, it is, but we have never seen anything else besides a, an, an episiotomy or a tear that comes, falls together in between each stitch. And I can tell you, it's all about habits. If you know your anatomy, you know where the mucosa is, you know where the hymen is, you know where the muscles is, where to identify it, then it's just a different way of seeing, of, of, uh, seeing the, uh, the tear. So getting used to the speculum is very easy, I can tell you that. Um, so here we're closing in one layer all the way out to the hymen ring, and then we tie a knot there. And remember, this is not a suturing course. This is to demonstrate how we use the speculum. So I don't want to confuse the different departments out there. Uh, but this is how we do it in Scandinavia. We suture the vaginal floor all the way out to the hymen ring, and then we, we tie a knot there, and then we focus on the perineal body. Some, uh, the vaginal floor, we do conti uh, continuous sutures, and then we do the transverse and the bulbal cavernosus in, in, um, in, uh, in, in, in um, not in continuous, but interrupted sutures. Some do it continuous sutures. I'm a big fan of interrupted sutures uh, for the muscle groups, uh, because I think you have a lot more control and you have much, much more control of how to align it. Um, so the next one is how to use the, you see the circles here on the speculum. So this is video is, is uh, demonstrating how we use them. And when you get used to it, you, you become a very big fan of the, of the circles. So here I'm closing the musculus transverse, and I always place two interrupted sutures in the muscles transverse. So here I have already placed one suture. I just and then I just parked the suture here. I didn't tie the knot. And then I placed the second suture here. And then I wait to tie both knots until I placed both sutures. I think it's very, um, very nice to build up the suture or your perineal repair step by step. And especially if you have students, then you can double check. You can say, are you happy with your suture? Because if you tied a knot wrongly the first time, that's going to affect the second knot as well. So here I go back to my first knot and then I double check again if I'm actually pleased. Uh, you see here, I just take it and I double check. Yes, I am very pleased. And then I tie the knot. Uh, it's just a really good step-by-step -step process when you are, when you are um, building up your, your repair.
And if you are a student, it's much less stressful. I always tell the students, wait, don't tie your knots. You know, there's no stress with those knots. Wait until you're sure. If you're not sure, you just, all you do is you pull it through and you place it again. So this is, this is really a nice way to double check your own work. And also when you sit next to the student that you are together with her in double checking uh, him or her that what she has done is actually uh, correctly. So here we place the second suture and then it's time to, to move on to the uh, bulbocavanosus. Here we're closing the bulbocavanosus. We already placed one suture. It's just to shorten this uh, presentation down so you don't see everything. But you see how well the, the, uh, the tear lines really well, even though the speculum is in. I use, I leave the speculum in for eight out of 10 suturings. And then the last, sometimes I just take it out if it seems to, st to stress a lot to, on the tissue or if it gets too tight. But in, in most, most cases, I leave it in. And I can hear I'm speaking on this video. Um, so it's the, the tear will close very nicely. She's just giving birth. So on a cellular level, these cells have really been stretched. I once heard that they give like 200 times themselves when the baby's born and then they, they kind of go together again. One of our leading physiotherapists in, in Denmark was is very knowledgeable about this. So there's plenty of tissue uh, to work with straight after delivery, of course. Here we're closing the skin uh, and it's just, I just really emphasize to my students and in my department that we do a really precise fine job here. Uh, you know, when they have a cesarean section, they come out with this really neat little sc sc uh, scar on their belly. And here, this skin is so sensitive to the woman. This is where she's going to have her intimacy life. This is where she's going to have wear underwear. She's going to look at herself. And I think we, really need to do a really nice job to finish this closing of the skin all the way into the hymen ring. So it's just to kind of give you a picture of that you can still leave the speculum in even when you're closing um, the skin. This is just a, a, a continuous uh, intracutaneous um, suturing technique. And it's so nice to use a faucet because you can pull out the skin uh, where you want to uh, pull the needle through. So you have full control over your needle and how much tissue you get on each, uh, on each placement. And this is the woman before and after. And you can see over here, I don't know the story, but for some reason she came into the department and she had an episiotomy uh, in the, this side here. And this is a former, a previous episiotomy that she had. It must have been in a different country because in Denmark, for some reason, we always place it here. And in some other countries, they place it here. But you can see the little knots and the folds in her skin from the previous uh, episiotomy. And I, this is where from the new one. And I think it's nice that we have focused on this, that we inspect the women after uh, a delivery. I think it's 15% of episiotomies where the, the suture is not uh, good enough. Uh, where it actually disrupts, especially in here, in, in um, there's a recent study here in Denmark that it's at least 15% in the obese patients where the, the episiotomy sutures, the, the, um, the uh, dis dissolves way too quickly. So a good follow-up on, on women after suturing is really important in my, you know, a lot more focus on that. This is a tiny little tear and this is uh, any, old midwife or doctor would say, I can do this, you know, with my left hand. But if you have the, if you're going to have the speculum in your department, I always encourage people to start with really easy tears. Do it when you have students or young midwives, then the senior midwife uh, gets familiar with the speculum. So that's the focus for the old midwife or the senior midwives. And then the student can, can do the tears. In some departments, they get the speculum and then they keep them for the really, really complex tears. And then they, they get confused because it's, it's a new thing. And it's exactly the same like learning everything else. You're placing an IV in an 80 year old male who needs fluids, or you start with somebody with good veins, or if you learn to place a vacuum, you start with a very, uh, just a simple vacuum. Or if you start with anything, uh, you start in the simple, 
uh, end of the category, and then you work your way up. And that's the same with speculum and the tears. So this is a very simple um, second degree tear. And the young, you can ask the student or the young midwife, tell me what you see. What do you see? What kind of suture are you going to use? And where are you going to start? And how are you going to approach this? So the focus is on the learning. And I can sit next to her. My back is straight. My shoulders are not uh, in strain. And it just optimizes how we learn and how we look at suturing. As, uh, so I really like that, uh, that the, the midwife students, the young doctors, they leave the room with that feeling of accomplishment and understanding. Um, here we have a second degree complex tear. And I think that's probably the tear that doesn't get enough attention at all in the international uh, studies. It's always the, uh, the sphincter injuries, but I have seen a lot of really, really bad second degree tears that have taken a very long time to repair. Um, and a lot of women, this, this, this tear needs a lot more focus. Uh, it doesn't get as much as it should by far. Um, here they're using the sides of the speculum as well to kind of park uh, or hold aside uh, uh, some suture until they're ready to close it. And here they're closing the perineal body step by step. So it's another way to, to um, it's just to demonstrate that you will get really happy with those circles uh, on the, on the or suture holders, or so, sorry. So the suture, the, the holders or the sides of the speculum for placing a suture that you're going to work with later on. This is a, a I, I took this picture because it was a woman who had a really, I think it was a very flat pelvis. And we always talk pelvises when it comes to labor. You, when you're a midwife, you say, oh, she's got a perfect body. And when you examine her, you kind of, oh, that's got a very good pelvis. But when it comes to suturing, I always think, I also think that it's something that we should focus on because sometimes it's not, it's not us that are having trouble going in and inspecting. Sometimes they can actually have a very narrow arcus, a very high arcus, and it can be difficult to come in and inspect. This woman here, we placed the speculum and you can see how far out it actually came and, and still in her, this woman, it sits perfectly. You can sit, see like more than two inches up the vaginal floor. If she had a very high vaginal tear, you could address it very quickly and easily. And here you actually see that very soft elastic tissue that we have when we give birth. And that's the reason why we can give birth. I think that is absolutely amazing. But think pelvis when you are when you're suturing as well, uh, 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 that's, and that's where the positioning also comes in. Because if she's semi-reclined sitting up, she's kind of leaning forward and the pelvis is kind of pointing down. So you have to tilt it backwards, the pelvis, so that you kind of, you have that good view so you can diagnose and inspect her uh, correctly. A rectal examination is a must in, uh, in every uh, repair to check that there's not a hidden sphincter injury, uh, to check that the septum, the rectal vaginal septum is intact and that she actually has a good sphincter function is very important. I always ask the women, uh, have you had any problems um, since the last delivery or prior, sometimes pre-migardias women, uh, I always ask them, have you had any incontinent problems? Because we don't know the stories. And, and uh, so I think, of course, it's always with informed consent. Uh, always, everything in this slideshow is with informed consent, as I said in the beginning. Uh, and it's just to make sure that you have a full uh, and clear inspection of the full sphincter that it's intact and uh, before you start closing up um, too soon. Teaching is my passion. You see, this is how I sit when I teach. Uh, the student is in full focus. I can chit chat with the father, the mother, I can bring her a drink and I sit really well with my back and my shoulders and my wrist. And the focus is learning. The focus is not my nonverbal language when I, can't, when I get frustrated that the student is too low, slow, that the student is insecure on her knots. The focus is that she's going to do a really good suturing and she's going to learn it. Sometimes we focus on only the vaginal floor. Sometimes we fo focus on only the um, bulbal cavernosus, or you take one or two things and then I finish up. Depends on what time of day it is, how far is she in her training. Uh, maybe it's a young doctor as well. So you kind of uh, talk before you start what, what would be a good 
approach to this. Also depends on the woman, of course. Uh, you don't want to stretch it too long, but it's a good way to, it's the only way we can learn. Uh, so it should be done in a respectful way with informed consent, uh, and it should be in respectful way of the students as well. Another picture, this is from before COVID, uh, late night uh, under teaching. And it's just really nice that you can sit properly. I can protect my backs, my shoulders. I'm going to work day and night for another 20 years. And uh, I want both shoulders to work perfectly. So I'm really uh, keen on midwives having good working conditions uh, after the labor delivery, because that's where we are most tired. And, uh, and that's where the, they're knocking on the door to, to make us wrap up things. And that's where I put my foot down and say, this has to be done in a proper way with me sitting in a proper position. So think about that as well. This is a very, uh, this is an obese patient. She's 145 kilos. I think that's 22 stones. I don't know what that is in, in the US. Uh, she's a very large woman and here um, positioning is as with any other is also key. The knees has to go way back. If she has an epidural, protect your, uh, your arms, your shoulders uh, for when she's, uh, if she has, doesn't have that much movement in her legs, I can't control them. And then you tilt her up a little bit. That's really important in this patient category. And then you lift the, the upper back a little so that she can still breathe. And then always keep her, every woman that has given birth should be covered uh, when you're not actually suturing and a good well lock on anesthesia. And here I get so excited when I can teach a young doctor suturing in this patient category in the same way as I do a normal weight. I think it's very important that, um, that we can do this. And in this patient group, you have to place the speculum a little further in. Uh, so it's actually behind the hymen ring. And we are in the process of making one a little larger for this patient group. So it holds a little bit more aside, but still it's a huge help. And I don't have to stand and hold the side. It's so, it's sometimes it's so humiliating. So I think it's really, really important that we can see, we can work. And the patient is, uh, the woman is feeling uh, respected. The OR nurses are really a fun group. Um, they are used to instruments. They are, they take it out, they look at it, they, they test it, they, they know everything about how intuitive instruments works. And uh, I used to be an OR nurse as well for a short time. And I know exactly what it feels like to hold a speculum and, and supporting the doctor. And at the same time, you have to count sponges and bleeding and all that. So for them, it's really nice. They can place in the speculum and they can do what they're actually supposed to do. Here we have a third C uh, degree sphincter. And it's exactly the same thing when we educate the young doctors, you place in the speculum, the young doctor and the senior doctor can see the same thing. I think that's very important that the young doctor is not holding aside for the senior doctor. Here they can discuss where did that sphincter uh, disappear to and how do you pull it out again? I think it's super important. And this is something that the woman is going to live with for the rest of her life. So it's very important that we we teach well. This is just a still picture. And here we have a very uh, unlucky young woman who had a third degree tear and then she had an episiotomy. Uh, she was taken to the OR, of course, and then she uh, was, uh, she had a full anesthesia. Uh, and here you can see we placed in the speculum straight in and the surgeon, he is uh, closing the sphincter first. And in the second picture here, we have closed the sphincter. You see it in here in there, then we take out the speculum and then we focus on the episiotomy. So you see that we have actually turned the, turned the speculum a little bit and now they can address the, the episiotomy. So one thing at the time with the speculum, you can't put the speculum in and then it's expect to see everything. So one thing at the time, that's really key. So this is the, the, um, the episiotomy that they're closing in the OR. So it makes it very easy to go to the apex and place your starting knot, and then you work your way forward to the hymen ring. Sorry about the video, the camera. You never know when you have these tears. So it's sometimes it's an OR nurse or somebody who you ask to, to hold the camera. So this is a little bit shaky. 
And here we have, it's the same tear and they are almost done. So they're closing the hymen ring here and then they're going to finish with the bulbo cavernosus and then the skin in the, in the final. But it's just to see that they have turned the speculum ever so slightly so that it keeps being in the, the tear or the sutured areas keep being in the middle of the speculum in the focus area. And here you have the woman before and after. Uh, so she's still a, a little bit swollen, you can see, but her anatomy is very aligned. And she, she was admitted for three days. And then she came in for the, on the 10th day, we checked her again there. And then after three months again, and when she came in on the 10th day, we just removed this knot here because that really, really was painful. And then she was, uh, she was um, follow up after three months and she's continent. So this is really one of the good stories. Uh, she was continent, she was happy, she was a new woman, but she was in a lot of, she had some really difficult days. She was so traumatized by this. She never thought that this could happen to her. But uh, she is back and she's, uh, she's doing really well. So now we almost at the end. I just have three, um, three movies, uh, little videos on how to remove the speculum. To remove the speculum, it's the same as placing it. It, it takes about 15, 10 to 15 seconds. It's painful because you are manipulating with the cervix and the uterus. Uh, and especially the last part of the of removing the speculum. But still, when doing your suturing, it should not be painful. So here you see it's, let me just show you one thing. It's important that, that when you remove it, you get your finger on top of the speculum on this part here. There's some ridges here. And then when you feel those, you know that you're clear of the cervix. If the woman has delivered many babies, the cervix can be very thin and it can actually go over and, and uh, go between the speculum and you. So it's very important that you get your finger in and when you feel these ridges, then you're good to go. Then there's no cervix in between you and uh, the speculum. So that's very important. So here you see, oh, where did my mouse go? There you are. So here you see how to, I place the finger on the top. Oh, my printer is just starting to work, print something, I'm sorry. Then you push down on the speculum a little so it disengages from behind the pubic bone. Then you gather the sides of the speculum. Then you hold on to the sutured area and then you pull down and push up. That's it, a little coagulated blood has gathered. So this is not pleasant, but the whole suturing process should be a much better experience for the, for the um, woman. Here you have another one, and it's, it's the same thing. You see, I take my index finger, I push in the speculum a little bit so it disengages from behind the pubic bone so I can get the finger on top of the speculum. Then I gather the sides like that, hold on to the sutured area, push down and pull out, that's it. And then the last video, um, this is a second degree tear. So it's the same thing. This has got an episiotomy tampon. You push in the speculum a little bit. So in dish engages from behind the pubic bone, then you get your finger on top of the speculum. That's it, so gather the sides. And then you hold on to the sutured area and then you pull out. That's it. All right, folks, that was my introduction. Um, thank you everyone for, for taking your time and to listen to this. Um, I hope it will change the way we, uh, we suture and I hope it will provide a lot more um, learning for the coming uh, midwives. Uh, we will be starting to sell in the US as soon as possible, hopefully in the uh, in June. Um, you can, I'm on social media, I'm on Instagram, Elaine Hegenberger, you're more than welcome to follow me. I also, it will be Medco that will be our, our um, distributor in the US. And I'm just about to open the chat and to see if um, um, 
I will answer all your questions. Somebody's asking, does the speculum ever stretch the tissue worsening the tear? Not, no, it doesn't. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't stretch that much. It's very flexible, the speculum. So it kind of supports the side. It's not going to uh, overstretch the, um, this, the tissue. That's not happening. You just had the, um, uh, the baby has just been born. So there's plenty of room in there. When, this, when the speculum is completely folded, it's, it's three by three and it's very small. So it's actually not much bigger than um, a penis, I think you can say, but it holds the side uh, very nicely. Let me see. I'm just going to go through. There's a lot of questions here. Um, are there every, uh, some different sizes planned? Yes, we have one bigger size coming. Um, it's going to be for the very large women. Uh, this one is, is working for the, you know, the, the largest woman was the one you saw in the demonstration video. She was 145 kilos. That is really, I don't know how much in pounds that is. Uh, you probably know that, Leslie. Uh, and somebody's asking what kind of local. I always use a transcutaneous, uh, a dental block and then I put a gauze with a lot of lidocaine gel on and then I place that here and then I fold down her legs a little and then when after I leave her for it uh, not leave her but I take the legs down and I wait um, and um, and then after 10 minutes I put the legs up and then I take a forced forcep here and then I start down here and I work my way up here and I check that it's actually working. And then I always have some extra CCs in my syringe. Uh, if she needs for the muscles here, it's always the muscles that needs a little bit of extra. And then I usually always get a good, good pudendal block works for this area here. And then I always use the lidocaine or spray for, for up here, the, the clitoris and the upper labia and the urethra. So Bailey, <laughs> yes. it's 145 kilograms is 319 pounds. Someone was grateful and put okay. the conversion in the chat for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then let's see, is the intention to be used for every suture situation or where there aren't enough hands to assist? In my department, we've had it now for two years and it kind of finds its level. It's, it's, you have to invest a few speculums per midwife for them to get used to it. But then when, they, when they're familiar with this extra tool, they are very, midwives are very uh, uh, economically uh, oriented and they are not going to, to pull it out for every suture. But if you have a student and you have a bad back, yes, use it or prevent it from getting a bad back when you have students or young midwives. If you have a woman that's really does not like you, her being touched, then it's also a good thing because it it's keeps things quiet and not quiet, but calm. There's not all this. We have a tendency to think that our little four fingers are a lot more less gentle, uh, but they're not always. Uh, but somebody, something sits still. Um, so, and then of course the high vaginal tears, but it's, it's all depends on the, on the clinician as well. Uh, you just, sometimes you just have that artery that keeps bleeding, that keeps bleeding. It's maybe not a complicated tear, but it would just be so nice if something held it out to the side and then you can pull it out. But just the fact that we have a tool in the closet that's made for us, that's made by a midwife for us because we work alone. I just think that's so great. And I get so excited that it's, we are finally here. And if you do have any ideas out there, don't stop yourself, you know, just work it, work it with somebody. and. Um, Suddenly one day you can do as me. I'm not really smart. I'm just very stubborn and slow. So if I can do it, you can do it any time. And then would the speculum keep the tissue from suturing together? I don't really understand that. If it separates, I think somebody's asking if it separates. If you feel like it's separating too much, then what you do is you, you see here, then you, you gather the sides of the speculum and then you pull down to the sides and then you slowly let go again. Then you have a lot more tissue to work with down here. I should have a movie of that. I will do that. Um, somebody's asking about pain relief. I just mentioned that. 
uh, the price for the US is, I haven't, I don't know yet. We're waiting for the FDA and then it's up to the distributor, uh, Medco Solutions. I'm not going to interfere with that, but you can always ask them. Uh, it's single use, uh, this one. And before you all get angry at me for it being plastic, I know that uh, it's been a long process and um, we have been going through metal devices. We have tried all kinds of uh, um, materials and for it to be medical approved, it has to have some kind of, you know, it has to be a special plastic. And then back uh, four years, three years ago, when we had to decide it, I was way interested in water saving uh, initiatives because uh, we use so much water uh, for washing instruments. And we use like a thousand liters for a, a water birth. And there's just, I think we need to, it's just a long discussion. But anyway, I ended up having it as a single use plastic and it should be of course sorted in, in plastic waste. And your, I don't know if you do that in your hospitals, but here in the Scandinavian countries, we are sorting our, our waste a lot. So it, it's, it's going in the plastic re, uh, recirculation uh, but it's you. I when I have nights when I can't sleep because it's plastic, I always think of you know the, this speculum weighs about 17 grams of of, uh, of plastic, and then I weighed I weighed it, I weighed one of my shampoo bottles, and that was when that was empty, it was 50 grams. And then I was thinking, well, how many do I use of these per year? And then I probably use eight because I. I use four bottles of shampoo, I use four bottles of balsam and then conditioner. And then if I time that with 17 years or 70 years, then that's a lot of plastic. So when you think about plastic and, and the environment, I think we should look at where the, the, huge, um, the huge flow is. And what, one woman, she probably, she's probably going to use one of these in her whole life. So, oh, those, that's my only, uh, that is how I think about that's my, opinion on this so but um i know it's not popular but i'm we are working towards it and we are hoping that there will be better materials out there but for now it's sterilized and it's single use so you can take it to the or uh you can keep it in your bag for home deliveries um it's single uh, uh, um, packaging it comes in boxes of 40 uh so it's it's a I think it's it's a very neat product, and the women they like it. They like that it's not metal. They like that it's flexible, that it's shaped for the pelvis, that it's soft. They are not afraid of it when they see it. Where if I would open a big metal instrument, it's like you all know what it's like. It's just awful. Um, so let me see. Um, somebody's used a gelpis. I don't know what that is actually. Um, does the speculum ever stretch the tissue? No, I already answered that one. It doesn't stretch the, uh, the, the tissue more than it already have been. Uh, it's about between three to four kilos that the woman has delivered. So uh, let me see. Do you have a sewing pattern for the vaginal model? Is that this one you mean? Um, no, that's gynezone.com that sells it. Gynezone is our, our, the company that we use as our clinical uh, or our, um, our guide, our clinical guides here in Scandinavia. They, they sell uh, e-learning. It's a very good platform, G-Y-N-Z-O-E-N.com. That's really good. That's what we all use in Scandinavia. We kind of align all midwives, all clinicians in what's the best practice, how to suit you. Um, let me see. If there's any more questions, Gine Zone. Mainly, there was a great one about just in the US, we don't do as many pudenda blocks. And so we wanted to know just like the pain perception if we use just more local anesthesia and the different methods. So you, I don't think, I think you have a much higher epidural rate in the US if you're delivering in the hospital. In, in Denmark, I think it's about, I think it's about 65% in pre gravidus and then it's about 35% epidural rate for multi para women. So it's, it's local anesthesia is, uh, is something that we are very uh, common to use. And of course, if you, she has an epidural, then she might need it or she's really, 
comfortable with it. But what was the question, Leslie? Was it what we use? We use. They light. wanted to know for pain perception with the lady because you were talking frequently about pudendal blocks for pain management. And a lot of our out of hospital women, or if they don't have an epidural, we tend to use just local anesthesia with lidocaine. So we wanted to know with the speculum use and pain perception. No, oh, okay. We, I, I always uh, place the uh, local anesthesia first. Uh, it, it, some midwives, they prefer to use uh, lidocaine um, and they use it as an infiltration. Uh, and then they leave it for a little bit to absorb and work. And then they test it. And, and some people like me, I always use a pudendal block. And that means I, I go in in each side in the skin here with a needle. And then I place uh, five cc's in each, in each place. And then I leave it for, uh, for 10 minutes. And then I place a lot of lidocaine gel here. And then I, I, uh, I leave the woman with her legs down to rest a little, get a drink. And then after 10 minutes, I, uh, I place her legs up and then I start to diagnose. If I can see that she definitely needs suturing, I'm not going to inspect and diagnose without pain medication. So that's a local anesthesia. That's why I place a lot, get her, give her 10 minutes to rest and then get her legs up. And then I start to diagnose I do rectal examination with the local anesthesia working uh, to make sure that I diagnose correctly. And then I start to suture. A lot of places you diagnose first and then you place the local anesthesia. I don't see the reason why not doing it the other way around uh, for the woman and for me, because if she's more relaxed, I can see better and I can diagnose better. So that's in her interest. Um, I hope that was an answer to your question. We also use gas and air. We also use acupuncture. Uh, I'm not, I should have mine recertified. I'm not very good, but there's always one in the department that's really good with acupuncture. They can come in and place the needles. She can maybe have a little bit of gas and air and then a local anesthesia. So to address that uh, issue is very important that she feels she's being heard and she can always say stop. Uh, it's always with informed consent. Um, and it's kind of, it's in her tempo. So it's important for her to know what has happened, what kind of degree. And then we always inspect the tears on the on when the woman comes in with her baby for the hearing uh, test and for the heel prick. That's where we offer to check her, her suturing to see that it's, it's uh, well done and that she's doing really well. So uh, check those suturing, check your work. And uh, in, in the Gynzone, um, in that hospital where Gynzone is developed, they resuture about 4% of all their women. So they come back, they have specialized trained midwives that resuture women. And then they, uh, they go back to the midwife and say, that suture you did, uh, that didn't really work out. So we, we resutured her. And then you can kind of optimize the clinical skills in the department. And you should not be afraid of somebody coming and uh, saying, well, that one didn't go well, you know, this is the problem. And next time maybe use a different suture because it's very important that we choose the right suture material, not something that dissolves way too quickly. When it comes to muscles, it has to hold those muscles, has to suture those muscles. And if it dissolves within six to eight days, then why suture then? So uh, it's very important that you know the material that you're using, what kind of suture material. Maylene, a couple of great questions people asked. Um, do you give everyone the pain management, whether they need a repair, just for an assessment? I think there was a little confusion of, do you use it just for the insertion of the speculum to visualize or use it for the repair? No, I always visualize and diagnose. You know, sometimes if they've given birth in, uh, let's say, the double bed in the labor room, or if they've given uh, um, they're given birth in, on, on, the, on the stool or something and, and it's intact penium. It doesn't really look like they need suturing. Um, then I kind of just peek in and if it's an intact uh, vaginal floor or a tiny little bit, then I just take them up on the bed or I peek in when they are on the floor without any pain management. Um, if it's obvious that they need suturing, like a second degree tear, or it's obvious that they are bleeding, then, then I ask them to, to go up into the labor bed and then I put their legs up. And then if it's a bleeding, that's what we address, of course. If it's a suture, then I, if it's a tear that's obvious, then I place the local anesthesia, wait for 10 minutes, and then I diagnose. There's just some times where it's obvious they need suturing. 
then I don't need to I don't need to go in and inspect without local anesthesia. I always place local anesthesia, test that it's working, and then I go in and diagnose. I see where the tear is. Sometimes they have two tears and one in each side. Sometimes they have an episiotomy. Uh, and then when I know where the tear is, then I place the speculum where I need to suture. So I don't, okay. di I don't diagnose with the speculum. I diagnose with my fingers still. I need to uh, do a rectal examination. And then when I've diagnosed, then I know where to place the speculum. I guess one last question on this topic, people were asking, because in the US we don't do as many pudendal blocks, I think the times we see it, is the hospital more to the perineal stretching, burning, if the epidural is not covering. So at a hospital, it's pretty standard in the US to use just local anesthesia. Um, so I would love just to have a more of a discussion of like the cultural ways of doing pain management and with the speculum and re repairs, the patient's perception. So that's something yeah. we can definitely I more. think I think you have a lot more epidural, and I think um, uh, I think the, the women with epidurals they have a tendency to have less pain when they when the speculum is being placed, uh, and then you probably use lidocaine or gel or a little bit of infiltration in the U.S. But they still have that really well working epidural. So I'm sure some midwives turns it off when they need pushing or when they start to push. I don't know if you do that, but. Uh, but I know from my experience in the U.S. that you have really well-working epidurals in the U.S. You're really good at that. Uh, so I, I think actually that will be a benefit in placing the speculum. I think the, the women will have much less pain uh, in the U.S., um, um, but there's also I think it's a lot of mainly the ladies that are on this um, because of my following tends to be more independent private business owning midwives tend to be that out of hospital birth center setting so yeah I think you and I can have some great discussions of like is there a better way how much what is the dosage to do local or is it recommended with a Hagenberger speculum to do a pudendal block to help with their discomfort yeah. so I think those are great discussions to have in the yeah. future one question that's been asked a couple times they wanted to clarify is the Hagenberger or speculum used just for suturing or can it be used to visualize the cervix or like a procedure such as a pap smear no no not not yet it's definitely in our agenda because there's like a fair and you know there's probably like 200 speculums to to inspect the cervix uh, i went through 1800 speculums when i did the development of this and the, there's so many of those that are for inspecting the cervix for placing iud's for gyn procedures and I wanted to make something that was specifically for postpartum tears. There's not much out there for postpartum tears. Uh, and that was my key. I want to make this a lot more prestigious. I want to have a lot more focus. So I wanted to make an instrument uh, where I saw, where I can see everything but the, the cervix. And of course, if you have a cervix tear, the woman needs to go to the OR. You need to suture that and to stop the bleeding. But for many, many, many women, it is uh, uh, the, the tear is the focus. And so this speculum is actually pushing up the cervix a little bit so you can see much higher in the vaginal, uh, in the vaginal floor. And that's what it's made for. It's made to sit by itself, pushing away the cervix so you can see the vaginal floor and, it's, and it's, uh, you, can't see, you can't see the cervix uh, through this for GYN procedures. That's not what it's made for. It's made for specifically for us as midwives for postpartum uh, suturings. Yeah, the last question that just popped up, they were asking for out of hospital birth center home birth. And I do think it can be used there, but you and I would have to talk because we don't do the pudendal blocks. We don't do the epidurals. No. We just want to make sure our ladies, we're not going to be the first ones testing. Oh, just straight minimal local anesthesia yeah. is, yeah, we would no, love I to. Think, I think in the home birth settings, you would probably have acupuncture. You would have infiltration. You would have gel and spray. And for most, you know, that you can get a very long, far away. You could get a lot of good, work, well-working uh, local anesthesia with that. Some women are so good at relaxing in a home birth setting that they, you can place it with very little. Uh, as I said before, when the speculum is sitting still, it should not be painful. And uh, we had, did in Oslo, we did have a labor clinic where it was, a, it was like a home birth setting. They didn't have a lot of... Um, of um, things to work with. Um, and there we placed it on our uh, uh, power three, you know, four time mom, and she was very relaxed and she knew what we were doing. And as soon as it was in and she was lying in the bed, holding her legs, then she was comfortable. So 
it's it's also about the patient and uh, you can get very far with spray and gel and infiltration i think but it, the main thing for me is that that she is informed she is given consent and that she can tolerate the suturing that it becomes a good good experience and that you can work and do what you're supposed to do in her favor so did you see any other questions mainly on the list that Eric printed? Because I'm just looking through the chat and I think no. we covered everything. Yeah, no, I don't see anything here. Um, I hope that you've seen something new, that you might have learned something new. And I wanted to thank everyone for taking the time to sit and listen to this Dane across the pond. It's getting dark here. Um, so uh, you can always contact me on my Facebook, uh, no, on my homepage website. I do online teaching every Tuesday, uh, but that's not really in your favor because it's Danish time in the morning. But you have a night shift and you sit and you're bored, then log on and join me. And um, and uh, so if there's any well, I appreciate you, Maylene. You are amazing. I got the privilege of meeting you a couple months ago, and I think what you, uh, with the Hagenberger Speculum, your wonderful invention, and what Gynezone, the collaboration, you guys are going to change the face of how um, perineal tears are looked at and the complications. I've learned so much being part of Gynezone so far the last month, month and a half, so I definitely encourage. It's very affordable, and it, it's, it's amazing quality of education, so thank you for bringing this to us you're welcome my pleasure always and i'm just an email way so if you are if you are in a department and you have a, a like a colleague group or you have a, a, a in your department you have focus on suturing you can always write me an email and we can do a private session i did the ferry islands the other evening and there was 20 midwives so you know i don't do one-on-one -on -one, but if you are a group you have a department where all the midwives are gathered then please send me an email i'll be happy to to repeat this for us as you know, a closed group somewhere. So that's always an option. Yep, and you can tell colleagues if you weren't able to make it today. I know we had a lot more people signed up, but as midwives, we're on call and we never can predict what babies need. Um, we will be recording and putting this on uh, the YouTube channel for Midwifery Business Consultation, Facebook, and a few other platforms. So it'll definitely be available for the midwives to learn from. So thank you so much for your time today, Maylene. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And continue doing all the great things you do out there. Okay. Bye-bye, right. Danny. Bye-bye.